Ladies and gentlemen, dear minister, vice chancellor, colleagues, welcome to the 12th Baltic Sea Science Congress. What I will do now in the next 50 minutes is to give you a background about this, uh, this conference. And then I will, of course, give you also some practical detail. But before I start with that, I would like to show you this beautiful picture. This is why we are here. That's why we are CARE. And it's worth investigating. And for most of us, investigating this system, this, this is curiosity driven. And it's worth investigating, but it's also worth protecting. This means if you want to protect the system, we have to compile our knowledge and bring this knowledge to the right place in society. I think this is what we have, as scientists, have to do. Uh, we all know that the Baltic Sea is under severe pressure. And the most famous or the most known example, and we deal with this in several decades, is eutification. And um, <clears throat> we have done tremendous efforts here. And because we had an we had dealt with this issue the last three, four decades. We have compiled our knowledge. We have developed understanding numerical models to simulate the situation on algal blooms, dead bottoms in the Baltic Sea. And we fed this information into a political process, into HELCOM, into this intergovernmental body for the protection of the Baltic Sea. And this was signed by the ministers of environment in 2007 and 2013 and we firm commitments reducing the nutrient loads to the Baltic Sea. And here we see this tremendous success. These are the nitrogen river and loads and phosphorus river and loads. They peaked in the 80s. This curve is the atmospheric load. The horizontal line gives you the maximum allowable input, telling us, or the models tell us, when we have these loads, then we reach a healthy ecosystem in the Baltic Sea. But this curve, with the peak in the 80s, and then we go down, Due to the political process, due to our efforts on land and with sewage treatment, also in the agricultural sector, we have reached so much. And this is really unprecedented elsewhere. And we can be proud of that. Understand me right, I don't say that this problem is solved, not at all. We have to continue with our efforts on land, sewage cleaning, but also especially in agricultural sector we can do. But scientifically, we have an understanding and we have delivered, and now we have a political process, the Baltic Sea Action Plan at hand, who takes care of that. But we need patience for that. And all of you know, all of you scientists, you get very often the questions, how is the Baltic Sea? Can I bath in the Baltic Sea? Is it completely dead? No, it's not. But there's a frustration out there because the water resonance times in the Baltic Sea, some 30 years, it took us 100 years to pollute this sea. It will take some decades to clean it up. We need patience. But I think what we have to convey to society is that we are on the right track. And I think we can look and, and into the climate, climate debate. Here we talk about peak CO2, loading the atmosphere with CO2. And this is a summary of our model results here from, from Eric Gustafsson here, from our group, looking at the phosphorus budget in the Baltic Sea. So this is nothing more than here over time. The waterborne sources peaked in the 80s, it goes down. And then we have sinks, of course, in export to the North Sea, and then something in the sediment that ends up there. But what we see here, since 2000, we don't load the Baltic Sea anymore. It's in steady state or even is depleted. And this is, I think, what we have to convey, that we are on the right track. It will take decades. There's no quick fix. But I think, and we see signs now, that nitrogen is decreasing in the Baltic Sea and even slight indications that phosphorus is decreasing. But now I come to the future uh, challenges. It is still difficult for us to answer the question, how will the ecosystem unfold? Even if we have now the loads to the nutrients and from nutrients from land to the sea is about the same as the 50s, will we see the same ecosystem as 50 years ago? No, probably not. Because other drivers take over. Climate change will be the most prominent driver. But also pollution, fisheries, ecosystem uh, dynamics will be very important. 
And this is really the, the, the future questions. How will the ecosystem unfold? And with this background, we met with the scientific steering committee here a year ago, a leading year, and we had two days of very fruitful discussions. What are the current and future research challenges for us? And we came up with five sessions and we designed this, this, this um, Congress according to that. Session one. Session one deals with external drivers, external forcing. And here, climate is the big, big issue. Here, this is the same station, the same picture. This is, this is made by the Tverminer team in Finland, one of the longest records of temperatures in near the coast, in 31 meters depth. Until the 2000s, we see ups and downs, and this is climate. This is NIO index. Many, many people know much more about that than me. But what I think is really what was touching to me when I saw the last development here, these are the last 10 years. It's really, it goes rocket high up. And we have to understand what is man-made, what is local, what is, what is due to changes in currents. We have all the experts here. But as a matter of fact, these critters were, were sitting there last year summer. They really got it hot. This is what we can say. But this is, of course, a challenge here. Then, of course, we look into the, in the, into the catchments. We have loaded the system with millions of tons of nitrogen and phosphorus in the catchments. And they, they, we call about the legacy phosphorus and nitrogen sitting in landfills, agricultural soils, lakes, everywhere. First calculations tell us this will leak 30 years more. But I think in the next 10 years, we have to do more research and, and, and refine this number. Of course, here in this session, we will also address effluents from, from sewage, like pharmaceuticals, but also microplastics. Session two. Session two deals with the coastal seascape. And here, this is where we, as human tourists, um, uh, experience the sea uh, closest. Here, we will have issues like um, you know, biodiversity, the role of top predators will be discussed here. But of course also pressures due to uh, boating, uh, marinas, jetties and, and affluence from them. This issue will be discussed in, in, in this session. Further on, it is, will be discussed here, sorry, discussed here, that many of us, the, the coastal seascape is a mosaic of habitats. And we are used to do small-scale experiments of a square meter. And it is much more heterogeneous and mosaic than the open Baltic. And the challenge here, the research challenge, is how we scale that up. How we scale that up to societal relevance. Because, again, here how you see these pictures, here we make really make most use of the sea. About 50% of the world's population lives very close to the sea. So, th session 3A and B. Here we look at the, at the, at the uh, uh, inner Baltic Sea, we look at issues as seawater inflows, how they will change with climate change. We will look at large-scale anoxia, the dead bottoms, and the development of, of algal blooms. In session 3b, we address food web aspects, everything from fisheries, top-down controls, Key functional species like blue-green blue algae and so on will be discussed here. Further, many people fear that the Baltic Sea will be transformed into a boreal lake, a brown boreal lake with a lot of organic carbon transported from the catchment into the Baltic Sea. This would mean that the, the Baltic Sea could be transformed from a neutral carbon balance to a source of carbon in terms of methane and in terms of carbon dioxide. That's why we need new techniques to, uh, to, to identify the microbial food web. And here, genomics, omics, will be new possibilities for us to indicate also functional key species in the food web. Session four. Session four is, um, will deal with monitoring. Monitoring is a cornerstone for an understanding of the Baltic Sea ecosystem. The Baltic Sea is one of the data richest uh, marginal sea globally. But here we will discuss an automatic system like these gliders 
They measure automatically variables like salinity, temperature, chlorophyll, and they are automatic, automatic vehicles. We also, within these bonus projects, we had a lot of um, development of ferry-based automatic systems. And all these technical aspects will be discussed here. And we will also have the bonus workshop technology for science. And here, bonus, the bonus secretariat helps us also with financing this, this session. Session number five is um, about policy and management. I mentioned it in the beginning, the HELCOM process is of vital importance for the Baltic Sea. I think we have a good, very good uh, relationship to, to the people and officers working there. What I said before, I think the eutrophication section is most developed, but we will we'll work all of the, these other biodiversity, hazardous substances, maritime traffic, eutrophication. We all need and will convey our knowledge to these decision makers. Then, of course, on the, on, the, on the European level, a lot of talk is about this blue growth. But there's a lot of buzzwords. We have to fill that with something. How is it possible that we have a HELCO ecosystem and simultaneously explore this system by aquaculture, by marine traffic, by all these things? These are nice words, but I think here are the people in the next 10 years, we have to fill it with some scientific knowledge to help the decision makers to take the, 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 the right decisions. So these are about the five sessions, which will be in parallel here the, the coming four, four uh, days, and I'm looking forward for interesting discussions. And we will also have events. We will have, of course, uh, this afternoon, a poster session, and we will also have speed talks. Which, and for everybody who registers for speed talks, please upload until noon your if you want to be in, in, in this group of speed talkers, so to say. And then you will meet at about five o'clock in front of the screen we built up here on the fifth floor. And Lisa will help you um, um, through this uh, speed talk event. Then we will have something like a pitch pit. This will be explained later by Nancy. Uh, this will be also tonight. Then we will have, and we are really happy that the uh, city of Stockholm invited us in the Noble Bank at Venuri in the, in the city hall on Wednesday. And please be in time and bring your this white invitation card. Otherwise, they will not let you in. I think we have 310 people who wants to go there, but please be there in time and bring this card, otherwise they don't let you in. And then we have a very special opening, and we call this mock press conference, and you will we'll, we'll hear much more about that in about half an hour. But I want to say some, some words about that uh, in a, in, uh, now. This is, has been really, we are very grateful to the, again to the bonus secretariat who made this possible. What we want you, we want you to discuss, and we want you to uh, discuss about what does society really want to know about change in, in, in the Baltic Sea. And for that, we have brought in Nancy Barron from the Compass team with her team and some scientists who will do this press conference in, in, in about half an hour. And I think here you really get into the nutshell the, the, the most important findings on biodiversity, pollution, eutrophication, climate issues, and fisheries. So I really recommend this, this event. And again, we are really grateful that this has been, this has been sponsored by the Bono Secretariat. Without that, we, this we wouldn't be able to do that. So, some practical issues. Um, here, this is a sketch of the Aula Magna. I'm staying now here because we have divided now this hall into two. This is the left hall, this is the right hall. Here, this is floor five. Here we have all the, 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 um, the food is served here. Here in this corner and in this corner is other poster sessions tonight. Here is about the screen where we have the, the, the speed talks tonight. And then one floor up is the mezzanine and there's a balcony. There, Nancy and her team, they will do this pitch pit and you will explain a little bit more about what that is a little later. This will be also happened tonight. And then here on floor, here on fourth is then the, 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 the um, uh, registration. So, um, then uh, we have parallel sessions, 
starting uh, with this afternoon, we have here, this is called the left hall, the right hall, and then this is here the Aula Magna, here's the Tunnel Bana. Here, if you come here, you can go just over the lawn or you, you, you take the, the, the path here. And here is the geological building, the geo building. And here on the left side, you go in here, but there will be signs here. There's the Gear Lecture Hall, where also some of the sessions will take place. So, but people will help you, will guide you, and I think this will be not, not a problem to find that. So, key people. There will be people that will have these kind of ribbons on, and they, of course, they have worked a lot more than many of us to make this happen here. Um, we have people here helping for the registration, the presentations. You can talk to these people, posters, registration, and then pitch pit and speed talks. This is Lisa, too, who will help you with, with, with these things. So please ask everybody. And I shall also announce some people wanted to have a participant list. And this participant list, this has been now produced. And this is available, I think, at the registration. This was something what was discussed yesterday. Okay, practical issues. Um, the opening session now is now live sent and uh, talk to the registration if you don't want to appear in a photo from the Congress. Then, very importantly, session leaders, and I will meet all of you at one o'clock in front of the registration to give you some, some more insights in the logistics here and speakers, be there in time. And please, 50 minutes before session starts. And all of you, I think we have 147 talks and we have now about 120 uploaded. Please upload your talks as soon as possible. Otherwise, it will be because we have these logistics, we have the De Gea Hall. It's really, it's, 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 it's a huge place here, so it's not easy to, to get that arranged. So please upload your talk as, 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 as soon as possible. And please, speakers and session leaders, be 50 minutes before there in, 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 in the lecture hall before the everything starts. And the major talks, except the keynotes, is 10 minutes, and please leave five minutes for discussion. We really want you to, to discuss. Okay, with this set, make connections for the future and have a lot of fun. Thank you very much. So we will have questions, will be, will be answered after, so at about uh, 12.30. And next speaker is our Vice Chancellor, Astrid Söderberg Wedding. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Minister, dear conference participants, ladies and gentlemen, as Vice Chancellor or President of Stockholm University, it is a great pleasure for me to join with Professor Humborg in welcoming you all today to the Ola Magna and to the Baltic Sea. Science Congress 2019. Stockholm University was founded in 1878 in the spirit of enlightenment to conduct strong fundamental research and to be of service for society. Research on the Baltic Sea today really corresponds to both those aims. This is actually the second time that we have the honor of hosting the Baltic Sea Science Congress at Stockholm University. The first time was in 2001. With almost 400 participants from 10 countries this year, which is really impressive, we feel confident that this Congress will reflect many of the most important and relevant aspects of Baltic Sea science today. The program also testifies to the breadth of the approaches and themes. However, 80% of the participants come from natural sciences, 10% from social sciences, and the remaining 10% come from different parts of the management. This reflects the balance or imbalance in research on the Baltic Sea. As important as it is to present scientific solutions to the problems of the Baltic Sea, Questions of governance, among others, are equally important in order to implement these solutions. And here I am convinced that we must do more in the future. Stockholm University is a leading university in Sweden as well as internationally in marine research, with climate, seas and environment being one of its profile areas. With a number of expeditions with the icebreaker Odin, 
the latest right now going to northern Greenland and being a flag ex expedition as it goes to territories hitherto unexplored, we have an outstanding record in marine science, where, of course, the research on the Baltic Sea occupies a very special position. On my first day as president, on the 1st of February 2013, I had the pleasure of inaugurating our then brand new Baltic Sea Center, building on our strong research in the field. Through a generous grant from the, from the Baltic Sea 2020 Foundation, Stockholm University could also implement the Baltic Eye Project to finance not only research, but also analysis, syn synthesis, and communication to provide a relevant basis for decision-making by politicians and other stakeholders around the Baltic Sea. Through another grant from the Erling Persson Family Foundation, Stockholm University was able to finance its new research vessel, Electra of Aske, named after a small moss animal, but being 24 meters long and crammed with high-tech equipment. As far as research vessels go, this is not a large ship, but it is well adapted to the Baltic Sea and just as well equipped as modern research vessels for the world's oceans are. But the draught is small to allow navigation in shallow waters, and the smaller science means lower fuel consumption and a lower cost for the scientists. This vessel has already been of utmost importance in our strategic partnership with Helsinki University, where the collaboration between our field station at Aske and the Tvärmine station belonging to Helsinki University, as well as our partnership called Baltic Bridge, aiming precisely at bridging national efforts in research and communication, has greatly contributed to advancing and broadening our own activities. In the strategic plan for the Faculty of Science, research on the Baltic Sea has a high priority. The Baltic Sea Center handles the strategic funding from the Swedish Research Council on Baltic Ecosystem Adaptive Management, now used for hiring a number of tenure-track assistant professors within broad areas of research at various departments, also including human sciences. Together, they form a collaborative Baltic Sea Collegium within the Baltic Sea Center, and these professors will secure the field for the future. But the focus on collaboration with external partners is equally strong, not least through the Baltic Eye project, but also within the framework of broader initiatives, such as Baltic Sea Future, together with the City of Stockholm and the Sustainable Seas Foundation, which invites decision-makers around the Baltic Sea to yearly conferences and workshops. The new Baltic Sea Science Centre at the Stockholm Outdoor Museum Skansen, in collaboration with the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and again funded by the Baltic Sea 2020 Foundation, should also be mentioned. The central strategies of the university emphasize the importance of cross-disciplinary research where Baltic Sea science is the most prominent example. I strongly believe that this has a great potential to be developed even further. As we heard in the introduction, one aim of this Congress is to identify a new direction for Baltic Sea research based on the vast amount of knowledge that has been obtained with the many big EU-funded international research programs. Focus is moving away from the effects of fertilizers, where positive signs are observed, to new problems such as observed temperature increase in certain areas. Providing a better understanding of the crucial coastal region is, as we also heard, another area that is now more into focus. To quote Professor Humborg, because this needs to be emphasized again and again, the time is ripe to strike a new direction in Baltic Sea science. We are entering a new phase where we have to synthesize and make use of our knowledge to face all challenges for the Baltic Sea and help providing solutions. 
A main objective of Stockholm University and our Baltic Sea Center is to continue to provide synthesis and analysis of research results in order to make them relevant and accessible to politicians and other decision makers. I'm confident that the Baltic Sea Science Congress 2019 will contribute to furthering research as such, as well as this much needed analysis and synthesis. I wish you all most productive days to come, and I hereby declare the Congress opened. Thank you. The next speaker is the Swedish Minister of Environment and Climate, Isabella Levin. Please, Isabella. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of the ocean, first of all, uh, let me thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak at this uh, very prominent Congress, uh, maybe as the only politicians, politician here. So, in order to make um, wise and sustainable policies, we need facts and knowledge. Uh, and therefore, we need science. So your role here is extremely important for my work. So I'm very glad and humbled to be amongst you today. So please let me start with a, a brief uh, historical context on the problems of the Baltic Sea. So 200 years ago, Sweden was a very poor country. The economy was largely based on agriculture, but yields were low and crop failures were, were very common. Then by the end of the 19th century, things began to change. Yields were rapidly increasing, as were the number of cattle. The area of arable land was enlarged by extensive draining of lakes and wetlands. While this made it possible to feed a growing population, it also opened a new chapter in the book of mankind's relation to the ocean. We can call it the chapter of uh, the ocean waste bin era. Um, at that time, there were no industrial fertilizers, but still the changes in production patterns and land use and forestry and massive draining brought emissions of nitrogen into the sea. Uh, thus, you could say that the development of the wealth of the Baltic countries came to a large extent at the cost of our enclosed sea. The frustrating part is that we're still struggling with pretty much the same problems today. Not one of the coastal states around the Baltic has reached its nutrient emission targets. Eutrophication is the uh, environmental issue with the, uh, together with climate change, I would say, with the most critical impact of the Baltic Sea today. The reduction of nutrient loads from point sources, such as industry and municipal wastewater, has been successful. However, decades of excessive loading effects affects the Baltic Sea. It's an inheritance of a debt that would take decades to mitigate. And old debts will need to be paid. And we can pay them if there is political will and commitment. The cooperation around the Baltic is working very well on an expert level and clearly between scientists. What is lacking is political commitment. And today we know a lot about what needs to be done and where. To tackle nutrient losses from diffuse sources, the Swedish government funds, funds an initiative with so-called catchment officers. In more than 20 catchments, they will coordinate the local work to make sure that measures are implemented where they are most efficient. The government is also promoting the increase of knowledge and measures to deal with the internal loading of phosphorus and la in lakes and coastal waters. Some 70 years ago, 
European countries started to lay the pieces of a puzzle that would turn out to be maybe our best bet in the struggle for clean seas. The European Union uh, made it uh, possible for us in a truly unique way to cooperate transboundary between countries to uh, have binding laws and regulations in 28 countries. Through that, we got the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, we got the Water Directive, we got the Common Fisheries Policy, and the newly adopted plastic Directive on Single-Use Plastics. The tools that these pieces of regulation and legislation contain must be used effectively, and the rules they establish must be followed. Discarding of fish should be a thing of the past, and so should marine litter and contaminants. Clearly, we cannot yet be satisfied. Sweden will keep pushing for stronger legislation to protect the marine environment in the context of the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, some 15 years ago, I did research for a book that I wrote called Silent Seas that came out in 2007. At that point, I was extremely worried about the status of the Baltic cod. When the book came out, uh, the biomass of eastern cod stock in the stock was 90,000 tons. And many rightly perceived the situation as critical at that time. This year, 12 years later, the latest ISIS advice tells us that the number has now dropped to two-thirds of that. Scientists are now talking about a collapse of the eastern cod stock and also remembering us of the cod stock crash in Newfoundland uh, in the beginning of the 1990s. To me, the dire state of the cod is not just an important issue. It's a fundamental reason why I decided to become a politician because I believe that science must be used to make wise decisions. I'm therefore glad now, at this very late stage, that Sweden uh, was able to find support and also within the European Commission to have an emergency measure that stopped trawling for cod in the main cod areas in the Baltic Sea uh, just four weeks ago. This is, however, very tragic. We shouldn't have been at this point that we are now if we've listened to the science before. Uh, and we need to have more measures in order to, to save the cod, but also the, the Baltic Sea in its entirety. Two years ago, go, uh, all the countries in the world gathered in New York for the UN Oceans Conference. For one entire week, leaders of the world finally focused on the ocean. While planning for this conference that uh, Sweden hosted uh, together with Fiji, um, we wanted to show that we were serious about action at home as well as in internationally. And then we put together a new package of policies and budgetary reinforcements. In 2017, we made a strong commitment towards healthier oceans around Sweden. For instance, uh, there are around 17,000 shipwrecks surrounding Sweden. Some of those pose a severe threat to the local environment. Sweden made long-term commitments towards cleaning up those hazards. It's not easy, but it's crucial. We also allocated substantial funds towards cleaning up polluted sediments and to decrease the leakage of medical residues. Sweden also reached a target of 10% marine protected areas. However, it remains crucial to make sure that the marine protected areas are coherent and functional. Sweden also recognized that the oceans are a global concern and should be treated as such. We created a new global strategy for foreign aid focused on the oceans, climate and environment. It's now one of the pillars of our foreign development aid work. And today, I intend to make a new pledge for our international development cooperation. 
For 2019, the Swedish government are investing 3.7 million euros to support international organizations' work to implement measures that will improve the state of marine ecosystems around the world. This includes support for stre strengthening cooperation around sea areas, reduction of pollution and land-based pollution sources, issues related to ocean acidification and marine litter, as well as support to developing countries to participate in international negotiations. In the end of July, the new 70 meters long research vessel Svea arrived at its home port in Lysekil, north of Gothenburg in Sweden. It has got eight laboratories, room for 28 people, and a wide range of equipment to allow for thorough explore, exploration and examination of the sea. It's built to minimize noise and powered by renewable diesel. And I appreciate also that even its textiles are eco-labeled. I hope to see many of you in the inauguration and that you will benefit from Svea and the data that it will generate. Research vessels and their crew are a backbone of ocean research. They perform surveys that are core in monitoring of fish stocks and oceanography and provide data for national, regional and EU level management. In a changing world of climate change and human impacts, we need to continuously improve our knowledge in order to adapt and improve management as well as to mitigate future changes. Most of you participating at this conference are responsible for putting your piece to this puzzle, and I trust you to make sure that we can improve management to minimize negative impacts of the ocean. Dear friends of the ocean, in two years' time, there's a date of expiry that will arrive. By 2020, we're expected to have good environmental status of the Baltic Sea, and we all know that this will not happen. You know, often we set up goals to protect the environment, and sometimes it turns out that it's more easy than we thought. Uh, for instance, the European 2020 climate targets were uh, achieved ahead of time. But that said, too often we also see that we fail. But we cannot allow ourselves to become passive to the fact that the Baltic Sea is far from healthy. We owe it to our children. At this very moment, Greta Thunberg is sailing a small boat across the Atlantic just to make that point that we cannot give up on this planet and we all need to work hard to protect it and to save it. And we owe it to our children, but we also owe it to the sea that once assisted our countries in lifting us from a poor state to prosperous nations. And it's now up to us, the people who live around this sensitive inland sea, to make certain that while its troubles are ours to deal with, its beauty should be our children's to cherish. And with that, I wish you all a very interesting and productive Congress. Thank you. Okay, and now we will receive a greeting from the Commissioner Vela. This is a little film that will be played now. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Minister, Vice-Chancellor, Director, dear participants, welcome to the 12th Baltic Sea Science Congress. Thank you for inviting me to address you in Stockholm today. And congratulations to Stockholm University and the scientific team who organized this very important event. Science and research have long been the cornerstones of the European Union's fisheries and maritime affairs policies. Why? Because they underpin policies addressing the environment and climate change. Our common fisheries policy has made it obligatory to ask for and receive the best available scientific advice before defining management measures. Did you know that the basic regulation of the common fisheries policy mentions science almost 50 times?
It also refers to the best available scientific advice at least 15 times. Your work, your efforts, and your discoveries are directly linked to our fisheries policy. Your work helps us to set fishing opportunities and monitor their efficiency. We can see the value of your efforts in the progress that we have made in the Baltic Sea over the last 15 years. The lawmakers took scientific advice and created the Baltic Multi-Annual Management Plan. This has created a robust framework for fisheries and has also allowed us to promote planning in the longer term for multiple species and mixed fisheries. Also, with your help, 10 years ago, we launched the European Union strategy for the Baltic Sea region. It remains a successful example of a continuing regional cooperation. It focuses on saving the sea, connecting the region, and increasing prosperity. But let us not pretend to be naive, because you, as well as I, know that we still have a long, long way to go. The Helcom State of the Baltic Sea Assessment, which was published last year, showed signs of improvement, but it also emphasized how much remains to be done. Marine litter, eutrophication, and hazardous substances remain key challenges for the Baltic. And climate change, as well as other changes due to human impact, only add to this complexity. The very recent observations of the challenges facing the Eastern Baltic cod stock are telling. We know the issue goes beyond fisheries. We need good and comprehensive knowledge to help us to fully understand the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU's vision of the oceans and seas is to make and keep them healthy, safe, secure, and sustainable. We know from experience that we are capable of reversing the deterioration of the marine environment. We can safeguard the oceans through cooperation and through good policy making. We will continue to rely on scientific advice on fisheries, maritime affairs, and marine environmental issues. We will continue to rely on you. I wish you a very successful and productive conference. Thank you. After these introductory notes, now it's time for the mock press conference. And please, Nancy from the Compass and the journalists and the scientists, please enter the scene. And again, I would like to thank again the Bono Secretariat that has made this possible. And I really look forward to this really different opening of this, of this um, Congress. Please, Nancy. Go team. Good morning, everybody. I'm Nancy Barron from Compass. We are an organization that helps scientists communicate effectively so that the scientific evidence and insights from your work reaches the people and places where it can have impact. We've designed this opening plenary with the inspiration and support of our lead scientist, Christoph Humberg, and the wonderful Myra Sarola of Bonus. We're here this morning to make connections. That's the theme of the conference, right? Connections across disciplines, countries, and types of expertise, and to catalyze some important conversations that we hope will continue throughout and beyond this conference with the help of our distinguished panel of scientists and journalists. You are all about to embark on an exciting week in a deep dive. 
over the next few days, you'll be sharing the last 10 years of your research and hard work. A vast technical difficulty. A vast body of new and rapidly evolving knowledge about the Baltic Sea. So let's zoom out a little bit and before we tighten our focus and go deep. We want to begin with the end in mind. How do we bring this science to bear on addressing the challenges that lie ahead and kickstart action or in places where there's progress even accelerate it? And how can we rapidly scale up efforts that are already working? And how can we amplify your voices within the current social and political context and maybe, just maybe, have them heard? This opening plenary is meant to both introduce some of the key challenges and some pathways towards solutions. So in the next hour, with the help of our panel, we'll explore the question, what do people really want to know about the changes in the Baltic? And this means, how will it affect them? And what should we do about it? The journalists here offer valuable insights. They know their audiences. They know what they're interested in and what they care about. So they can help us translate that. They come to us from here in Sweden, Latvia, Finland, and North America. And you'll be hearing from them shortly. They're a very hand-picked and exciting bunch. They offer social and political contexts and also a reality check to our discussions. They can cut to the chase. They can bring in outside perspectives to broaden our thinking, to lift the lids on our thinking about how do we carry these messages coming out of the Baltic Sea Science Congress across countries, cultures, and sectors of society. So let me introduce the format of our mock press conference. We're gonna do this in three parts. First, we've asked each of our scientists representing an aspect of the research and themes you're going to be talking about over the next days to offer a personal perspective, an N equals one perspective on these very big topics. What do they envision as the way forward? And perhaps an example of what can happen. Then, five equally diverse journalists are going to vigorously question them, challenge them. And finally, we'll hear after this discussion and this back and forth from the journalists what they thought was most interesting and what they might want to know more about and what might be the story that would be relevant to their audiences. And you'll see that the media are very different. They're not monolithic. So before we launch into our opening remarks from the scientists, some quick introductions to the journalists. Sandra Kropa is a Latvian radio and television journalist to a national radio broadcast on environmental issues. She reports on oceans every chance she gets because she went to Tobago, saw the underworld, and was hooked. So as a reporter who covers the Baltic Sea, she's really eager to hear more from all of you. Peter Butchert is a Finnish reporter, and I hope I pronounce, if I, if I you know, sort of mangle pronunciations, please forgive me because uh, even if you tell us how to say it, we don't seem to be able to quite reproduce it. Anyways, Peter is a Finnish reporter who covers environment, politics, with a special emphasis on biodiversity and climate change. He is with HBL, which I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce. Say it. <laughs> Can you see why? Uh, the leading Swedish newspaper in Finland. And I had the pleasure of working with Peter at the 2017 Vega Fellows in Science and Communication uh, at Tavarmanin Research Center. So delighted to have you back. Now, David Malakoff is from 
a little periodical some of you might have heard of called Science. <laughs> and he is the deputy editor who covers how scientists influence government policy and how government policy shapes science. He's one of the most politically savvy people you'll ever meet. So if you want to talk politics and science, seek him out. Oh, and he spent a year in Rostock. So he feels deeply invested in the Baltic Sea. Kenneth Weiss, Ken Weiss, is an independent journalist with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Ken himself is a Pulitzer Prize winner for a series he did for the Los Angeles Times called Altered Oceans. And as part of his exploring the world and seeing how they're changed, he did a lot of work on how harmful algal blooms are replacing much biodiversity, and he came to call his, his series The Rise of Slime. He writes today for magazines such as Foreign Policy, National Geographic, Science and Nature. And he's never happier than when he's reporting on ocean issues and is in the ocean diving or surfing. And we are very delighted, last but not least, to have our hometown talent, Avianica Kielberg. She's the special reporter with the Swedish daily newspaper, Dagen Neheter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> Janneke focuses on climate and environmental issues, and her happy place is her summer home in Faro, in the middle of the Baltic Sea. So she has a stake in all this. Okay, let's get on with it. Our scientists have worked very hard to prepare their remarks, and to reward them, we're going to give them each three whole minutes. We'll hold the questions from all the journalists until they've each spoken. We'll start at the bottom of the ocean with Alf Norco from the University of Helsinki, whose research focuses on the ecology of seafloor habitats. And he's traveled all around the world and dove to see these up close and personal from Antarctica to New Zealand but he's really most concerned about the Baltic and what he's witnessed here in his 30 years of explorations. He hosted us at Tavarmin in 2017, and he's currently, right now, a guest professor at the Baltic Sea Science Centre. Alf. Thank you very much, Nancy. So, yeah, so, well, um, I'm a marine ecologist, and I've been working for the past 30 years trying to understand how our coastal seas work. I've spent a lot of time diving, and most of my research has focused on biodiversity and, and why it matters. It is clear um, that our world is changing really fast, and I've seen biodiversity change in many places around the world. In the Baltic, I've seen eutrophication smother and suffocate key coastal habitats, such as seagrasses and blue mussel beds. And I've seen white sandy seafloors being covered by rotting algae. The problems in the Baltic have been particularly bad since biodiversity is limited. The link between biodiversity and how our seas work can be likened with an airplane and the rivets that keep the plane together. We have very few rivets to start with, which means that biodiversity loss is really serious um, in the Baltic. Last year, something happened um, that woke me up. We experienced a marine heat wave in Tvarmine that was the worst on record. And we have been measuring temperature for 100 years. We saw seagrasses and mussels die off in the shallow waters, and we had the deeper muddy seafloors change from normally breathing seafloors to farting, flatulating bottoms, emitting huge concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane. Just a few degrees above the normal turned a normal temperature into a deadly fever. The good news is that we do see some positive signs. After all the years of hard work, as we've heard, some places look a lot better today than they did just five to 10 years ago. But climate change really has become an issue. But we do fail to realize that the bigger crisis is what is going on with biodiversity. 
This produces the air we breathe and underpins the many so-called ecosystem services that keeps us alive and makes life enjoyable. So what do we need to do? Scientists need to step up their game and resolve how diversity works in complex coastal environments. This does require interdisciplinary research and we talk a lot about it, but we're not always that good at doing it. We know that biodiversity can play an important role in mitigating climate change by providing carbon storage and carbon sinks, but we know way too little of how. We pay a lot of attention to long-term carbon sinks, but not enough on turnover rates of carbon and how it links to biodiversity. Not all carbon is equal. We want more of our carbon in mussels, fish, and long-lived seaweeds. Healthy ecosystems can store a lot of carbon in the form we can enjoy and slow down carbon turnover. Methane is just smelly. We can't protect and manage what we do not know. To you ecologists, I would say, we need to convey the importance of the biodiversity much better. To society and managers, I would say, do listen to the scientists. Currently, we have marine protected areas to protect biodiversity that, for, first of all, do not protect the most valuable habitats because we do not know what is out there and where. Secondly, where we have the MPAs, we still allow fishing, dredging, dumping, people on land or at sea to do whatever they want. Um, they are simply not uh, functional. By reducing local stressors for biodiversity, it has a better chance of coping against climate change and working in our favor. Sweden is known for its wealth and social welfare. In Finland, it is very similar, but supposedly we are also the happiest country in the world. We also like to think we are clean and green, but all our wealth and happiness, as the minister pointed out, comes at the expense of the environment and its biodiversity. So it is time to pay back. We could start by following scientific recommendations and making protection effective. We really have some good tools to keep the rivets attached to the plane. For this to happen, we need to even stronger link the climate issues to changes in biodiversity. Maybe we then could turn the flatulent seascapes back into breathing seascapes. Thank you. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Michelle. Michelle McCracken is unabs unapologetically obsessed with phosphorus and nitrogen. In fact, her Twitter handle is I heart nitrogen. How many of you are on Twitter? All right, that's great. Michelle analyzes large data sets to understand the amounts and magnitudes of nitrogen and phosphorus entering the Baltic Sea and their impacts. As a researcher at the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center, she's also very much a person who puts communication at the center of her endeavors. She too was a Vega Fellow in communication and leadership and now is going to be in Washington, D.C., working with the Ni National Science Foundation as a AAAS fellow. Michelle. Hi. Thank you, Nancy. So five years ago, I, I came to Stockholm University to join the Baltic Sea Center because I wanted to be part of a new team of uh, natural scientists like me, communicators, and policy analysts. Uh, this team is called Baltic Eye, and its mission is to uh, make scientific knowledge about the sea's environment more accessible to decision makers in the region. And in fact, this mission has meant so much to me personally, it just resonates so strongly with me that I've actually been commuting between the US and Sweden um, because my husband couldn't make the move here. As Nancy mentioned, my research uh, focuses on understanding how much nitrogen and phosphorus moves from land to sea. For decades, the sea has been loaded with these nutrients from sources like sewage wastewater and farm runoff. And the result, we all know too well, is eutrophication. The most obvious symptom being these large algal blooms that blanket the sea, you know, so large that they result in these iconic pictures. You know, you can see it from space. Now the first step to reducing eutrophication, or I'm sorry, reversing eutrophication is to reduce the amount of nutrients that flow to the sea. And in fact, when I uh, started working with Baltic Eye, uh, one of the things that really impressed me was uh, the, the, the extent of reductions that have been achieved so far. Uh, since peaking in the 1980s, nutrients have been reduced by half. 
And that's a huge success story. I mean, my reaction still today is that is awesome. You just don't see stories like this elsewhere. But what really surprised me is that when I started attending public forums, I would hear things like how the sea is dead or dying. And the sea is not dead. I mean, yes, yes, it suffers from eutrophication, but we've seen the return of important seagrass habitats. Um, water clarity has improved by up to two meters in areas. We are on the right track. Climate change uh, presents an uncertain future. We don't really know the extent it'll have um, on eutrophication in the sea, um, and it'll be a, a challenge to science and managers. This means we need to keep the focus on reducing nutrients to the sea, especially from agriculture. And our compu computer models suggest that we can make great progress in meeting the goals of the Baltic Sea Action Plan, for example, just by using manure more efficiently in crop production. Of course, it's easy to say that. The question is, how do we do this? And before I get to that, I would like to ask my colleagues from Baltic Eye who are in the audience to please stand for a minute. I know you're out there, I see you, so stand. Boop, 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 thank you. So you can see we are, there's a few more of us that are actually standing. No, go up. Everybody, communicators, <laughs> policy, all of you. Yes, thank you. So you can see we are a, a relatively small team. Please stay standing. Sorry, I won't embarrass you, I promise. <laughs> So we are, we are a very small team, as you can see, um, and, but we've really managed to have an impact and have policymakers listen to us and use the science. Um, but we've also learned that there's only so much one team can do. We need you. We need more scientists willing to talk to policymakers. We need more Baltic Eye type teams on every shore around the sea. So my, my hope is that um, during this conference, you'll talk to me and my colleagues who, who are standing uh, to find out how we can um, strengthen and extend our work. And my goal is that um, ultimately we can have more eyes on the sea. Thank you. Thanks. You can sit now. <laughs> Anna Sobeck is an expert in contaminant chemistry. She also hails from the University of Stockholm in the Department of Environmental Science and Analytical Chemistry, where she studies contaminants and how they are taken up in aquatic food webs. She looks at the consequences and impacts of chemicals and how good a job society's chemicals management systems are doing to reduce those risks. She too is trying to bridge the science policy gap and communicate those risks to society. Yunasi. So, I grew up in Sweden, and I went to school in the 1980s. This is a time when the seas were heavily polluted. Chemicals had over decades been flooding into the Baltic Sea. The media reported about dead seals on the shores of the Swedish west coast. This caught my attention when I was a girl and I wrote a school essay about the polluted Baltic Sea. And I do remember that I had trouble finding information for this essay. And today, I know much more. And what I know is actually giving me some hope. It turned out that the seals on the west coast were infected by a virus. But in the Baltic Sea, that had they had almost become sterile due to contamination, and those chemicals are banned today. We still find them in the Baltic Sea, and we would find them in all of you sitting here. And the reason is that these chemicals are persistent. They degrade very slowly, and so they remain for a very long time. The good news is that concentrations of these chemicals are going down in the Baltic Sea. This is one side of the story. The other side is that our comfortable lifestyle is hungry for chemicals. So think about this. We have 50,000 or so chemicals in use in Europe today. They surround us. They are part of our daily lives. They are in our clothes, in our phones, in the pills some of us took this morning. Then consider that for almost all of those, we don't know if they occur in the Baltic Sea or not. This brings me to some fundamental questions that drive my research. How much chemical pollution can the environment 
can the Baltic Sea tolerate? How much can we? And can we even measure that? During 20 years, I researched what chemicals are in the aquatic environment. Where do they come from? How are they transported? What risk do they pose? And the fact is, we don't know how much chemical pollution the Baltic Sea or us can cope with. To find out, we need to think new, and we need to think big. Many of you sitting here have the knowledge of how complex ecosystems function. You know how resilient they are to certain stressors and pressures. Leading contaminant chemists lack much of this knowledge. So we need to work together. And we need to study the cumulative effects of maybe thousands of chemicals, not only on single organisms, like the seal, but on ecosystems and on their functions. And we need to translate this knowledge into limits for what the Baltic Sea can cope with. This is very challenging. But I believe the way forward is to acknowledge and embrace this complexity. And I see this is starting to happen now. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Eric, Eric Chilstrom, first worked as a weather forecaster before he made a bit of a career shift. Now he's a climate scientist, a professor at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute with a special focus on regional climate modeling and he's done many scenarios on the Baltic Sea. He's also working at the international level and underpinning all of this is his love for the natural world. He spends a lot of time out there thinking and looking at the connections between climate and everything else. Eric. Thank you, Nancy. So, as Nancy said, 30 years ago, I uh, was trained as a weather forecaster in the, in the Swedish Air Force. Uh, at that time, I got questions every day about what will the cloud and temperature conditions be at three kilometers altitude above Gotland, for instance. And more importantly, will it be safe for us to return to land here on the airfield after our mission? Today, as a climate scientist, I often get a lot of questions about the weather as well. Was the very strong heat in the last summer of 2018 or the torrential rainfall drenching the city of Malmö in 2014, are these results of climate change? And how will such weather events change in the future in an even warmer climate? As a weather forecaster, uh, I used numerical weather prediction models to answer these questions. And today I use numerical climate models. These are virtually very similar. And throughout my career, I've been really fascinated by these models. Even though they are simplifications, they are still able to do really good stuff, actually, to really uh, simulate conditions in the weather and climate in a fairly realistic way. And to me, it stands perfectly clear that these models are really useful. We all know that weather prediction models really help to save costs and even lives of people. And we also know that the climate models, they can simulate conditions of the past, help us understand what's happening with the climate and also give us an outlook for the future. Uh, over the same 30 years as I've been working with this, uh, we know that there has been a very strong cli global climate change. And over the last decade, it has also become obvious that this is an issue uh, of emergence to and a key question for the hum whole humanity, actually. Climate change is already highly significant, and this is not least so for the Baltic Sea region. We have observed changes in this region of uh, strongly increasing temperatures, shorter winters, we have less sea ice in the Baltic Sea compared to previously, and we have changing precipitation patterns. The future is uncertain, but uh, it's from my point of view, it's certainly certain that it will be different from today. Climate is changing and will change even more. 
Our models now show that an even warmer conditions in the future, and sometimes completely ice-free conditions in the Baltic Sea, possibly very strong changes in salinity of the ocean. At the same time, the Baltic Sea is a relatively well-observed region. We have more than 100 years of data, and we have loads of data flowing into the system today. But it's also a very challenging area with complex topography. We have interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean and the land and the lakes. And we know that today's global climate models, they cannot really simulate this system in a, in a very good way. They are simply too coarse for that. But today we are developing new high resolution regional climate models that are not just for the atmosphere but also coupling with the, with the ocean, so they are coupled systems. And I think that these models, these are tools that really can help us with our questions. I think we can use these tools to help Alf with his questions on uh, climate change and biodiversity. We can use the model together with Michelle to address her questions about nutrient flows in the rivers and river inputs to the ocean to see how that is affected by climate change. And also Anna with her chemicals in the ocean, how will they be affected by climate and climate change. So finally, it's my really wish that these models can be used, not just for helping the scientists here with their questions, but also to help the Baltic Sea into a safe landing. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Henrik Esterblum is Deputy Science Director at the Stockholm Resilience Center where he works on climate change and fisheries. His focus includes global cooperation in the seafood business as well as sustainable fisheries and marine ecosystems. No small charge, as we already heard earlier today from the minister. He represents Stockholm University in the United Nations Global Compact Action Platform for Sustainable Ocean Business. And he's here to share his vision for the way ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I've been engaged in ocean management and ecosystem research for the last 20 years. I've studied the Baltic Sea ecosystem and how the ocean is managed in Europe, in North America, and around Antarctica. What I found is that there are promising examples of good management of the ocean, but the examples are few and mostly at small scales. I think we're all pretty familiar with the problems. And I've been frustrated by how slow change is towards more sustainable practices. Scientists, we often have a pretty good idea about potential solutions to the problems we're studying, but sometimes we forget to talk to the most important players about these solutions. Sometimes we don't even know who these players are. In my case, working with fisheries, the obvious players to talk to is the seafood industry. But a few years ago, I had no idea which companies to talk to if the aim was to address global ocean issues. Who was it that could influence the future of the ocean? We started to investigate, asking the question, who are the largest companies? How big are they? How much fish do they produce? And from where? We found that only a handful of companies had a major influence on the world's ocean, regardless of where we looked. The 10 largest companies produce 10% of global catches, and in individual regions, it can be a lot more. In the Baltic Sea, for instance, only one company regularly buy at least 25% of all cod being caught. So inspired by the ecological concept keystone species, we call these companies keystone actors. If they would take on a leadership role in sustainability, that will certainly make a difference, and similar to keystone species and ecosystem, that could trigger a chain reaction throughout the entire ecosystem of production. In this case, the global ocean. It would certainly make it easier for us to make sustainable choices in the grocery stores if they did so. At least, that was the hypothesis. So like most scientists, we wanted to test this hypothesis. Can keystone actors stimulate large-scale change throughout the entire seafood production system? We wanted to test it with an experiment. So we started to talk to the top executives of all these companies. We asked them if they wanted to take part in a series of keystone dialogues, which is what we call the experiment. Some were very reluctant, and some were very enthusiastic. 
after numerous conversations, we had a first dialogue three years ago, and the fourth dialogue with the executives takes part, take place in only two weeks from now. We're supporting the companies with our science, with an aim to help them become global leaders in sustainability. It's early days, but change is already starting to happen. Our Japanese members have started to integrate sustainability much more centrally into their operations, and we are testing exciting new ways to eliminate illegal products in their global supply chains. Our science has helped the companies realize that there is really only one ocean, and they need to play their part in taking care of it. It's actually in their own business interest to do so. So I think we have a big job to do as scientists, and also a responsibility in engaging with the industry in ways that does not force us to compromise with our science, of course. I'm convinced that scientists can find new ways to make connections and share our knowledge if we're going to be able to accelerate change. I encourage you to try it for yourself. You will learn a lot of new things. I think that your science will come to much better use, and hopefully you will also be able to do better science as a result of these new and surprising interactions. So please join me in engaging with the industry and stimulate further change for the ocean. Thank you. Okay, let's turn it over to the journalists now. Let's begin the actual press briefing part. I'm opening it now to you for questions. Just put up your finger and identify yourself and direct your question to whomever you would like to ask. Who's first? Ken. Well, thank you. Is this on? Can I think you, you can think push this on, maybe. On? Press yes, on. yes, on. <laughs> Well, thank you for not snowing us with a ton of facts and figures and such concise uh, and pithy uh, opening, opening remarks. Alf, I got to ask you something, though. Um, you know, we're facing perhaps a sixth extinction um, and an existential uh, threat of climate change. And I think you told us that biodiversity can help you know, that somehow store carbon. Could you go into that a little bit more? Tell us the evidence. I mean, it sounds very exciting, you know, as a human being, but it, it sounds also too good to be true as a skeptical journalist that we can actually preserve species and combat climate change at the same time. Yeah, thank you. It's, um, it is an interesting question. And I think, I mean, in Finland at the moment, we're talking a lot about our forests and their potential roles as kind of, you know, carbon sinks. And um, there's lots of conflicting information on what the case is. Are they growing? How effective are they as carbon sinks, et cetera? The more we get to know, the more we realize that some of these uh, protected areas that, that allow long-term growth and lots of diversity actually function as very effective carbon sinks. Um, but it's not so much about the sinks, it's about the turnover rates it's how the carbon is stored, what kind of ecosystem services that are delivered to us as humans. Um, actually, if we talk about carbon sinks, you know, our kind of hypoxic Baltic Sea is actually quite a good carbon sink. So, but we don't really want that hypoxic Baltic, do we? We want to have that biodiversity. So the point is that if we have a large variety of life forms that can store carbon for a long time and buffer that rapid turnover, that might be very beneficial to us. But we don't know. There's lots of things about that we don't know. And I think because the climate kind of crisis and the biodiversity crisis are actually linked, and, and we need to address both of them at the same time, and that's why we need to understand these questions better. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you, uh, you, you got there. I would love to see some studies on this that okay. they're measuring this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Hello, my name is Sandra from Latvian Radio and Television. I would ask to Anna a question about these chemicals. You mentioned 50,000 yeah, we are using in EU and it goes to the sea and we still are doing the research how much Baltic Sea can accumulate it and tolerate it. But don't you think that maybe we're running out of time while we are just really doing necessary research, but the decisions need to be made now? Like on which level, which decision you would expect from this? all kind of players, so we really solve this problem effectively? That's an excellent question. <laughs> I was hoping for it. Um, 
So the, the way that the regulation uh, around chemicals is designed today is based on what we saw in the seals in the 1980s. It's based on those types of chemicals, the very persistent ones that behave in a certain way. And now the diversity of chemicals is so much higher. And so we need to have a regulatory system that adapts to that. And one of the things that the scientific community asks for is to uh, regulate against persistent chemicals. So for instance, we have the PFAS chemicals that I suppose many of you have heard of, and maybe you as well. These are the chemicals that come from the fluorine industry that we have in our Gore-Tex uh, outdoor jackets, for instance, but in many other applications as well. They are very, very persistent. They never degrade. And they could slip through the regulatory system that we have today as it was not designed for these type of chemicals. So this is one thing we need to do. We also need to, also in the assessment of chemicals, we need to move away from looking at one chemical at a time. This is taking much too long, as you say. So we have to move towards grouping chemicals and regulate them as groups with similar um, design or effects. These are some of the things we need to do. We also need to have more transparency in what um, products and articles contain in terms of chemicals, products that are imported into the European Union. We don't know what they contain, and this is a problem. Yeah, Jadika. Yeah, hello, I'm Janneke from Douglas New Theater. And I would thank you all for very exciting things you told us. And I also noticed that a lot of you actually expelled some sort of hope, which is very nice. Most of the time it's very catastrophic, I think. But Henrik, I, I was very interested in your, um, your research. It's like a, the method is quite new, I think, or maybe not, but you decided to go out to the industry, to the biggest fishery companies. And could you tell me a bit more, how, how, did, you, how did, did you win them over? And what's the gain for you as a researcher and for the industry? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think the, the large scale and long term game for industry is that they all depend on a healthy ocean to be able to be in business. But uh, in more shorter term, I think there are primarily three reasons why they want to engage with us. One is because of people like you here in the room and otherwise are starting to pay extra for sustainable products. And they need to be able to show credibly that they are producing sustainable products. So the price premium there and the leadership there, I think, is one reason. A second reason, I think, is that the, the investment community is now starting to look for companies that are responsible. So there's, there's a lot of money going this way if you're able to show that you are actually doing your homework and are a leader in sustainability. And I think the third and, and probably most important reasons is because of the work that journalists like yourself are doing. Uh, because we, when we started talking to these companies in 2015, some of them were very reluctant to work with us. But then came the really big article on uh, modern slavery and, and uh, human rights abuses in fishery supply chains in, in Thailand, among other places. And that really re made the companies realize that the reputational risks are, uh, are fundamental and can hit a company really hard, really quickly. So they need to make sure that they really know what they're up to and, and that they are in control of their own supply chain. So I think these th three things, sort of the, the price premium, the investment community movement, and the, the risk of being exposed of doing bad things have really triggered the companies to want to engage with us. And from my side, it's, it's very easy. I, I am able to do much better science and publish in much more interesting journals. So, so that's, an, that's an easy argument for me. Peter. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Nancy. I have a question for, uh, for Alf and uh, Michelle, actually. Um, uh, you were, as I understood, talking about land-based solutions to, to reduce uh, nutrient loads into the Baltic Sea. Uh, and I wonder whether that's enough when uh, climate change is, is uh, pushing uh, the sea even to, uh, so, so rapidly. And uh, we also know that people are not very patient and, and that politicians 
want fast results. They want to see a, a Baltic Sea in, in an even better state faster. So uh, I know what you're going to an answer of, but, but uh, I still have to address you the question that why, why not to, uh, try these kind of geoengineering solutions that some people are uh, claiming will be a fast uh, track to, to uh, a better result. And uh, when you've answered that, my actual question would be, uh, isn't there a risk? Uh, aren't you taking a risk if you're not going into this uh, debate with these uh, people who are arguing this way? Thank you. Yeah, good question. We've discussed this before. Um, my view is, is um, quite a lot that unless we fix the heart of the problem, we won't fix you know, the consequences um, that we're kind of the symptoms that we're seeing either in the long run. And if we want to, um, you know, if the patient requires heart surgery, then it, you know, just a kind of a pill doesn't really help. Um, but that's, that's kind of a philosophical thing and, and an approach thing. But I think the, the, the problem is that most of these measures will be so expensive to actually be effective and, and, and actually make a difference that I think we should put that money to where the problem actually is and kind of prevent the future problems. We could go on, maybe, maybe. Michelle, do you want to? No, I guess my comments would echo um, what Alf said, that, that the geoengineering proposals address the symptoms and not the ultimate cause. And, 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 and at the scale that they've been proposed, it's, such, it's so large, there's just so many uncertainties that from a scientific perspective, we certainly don't have consensus that they'll even work. I mean, things can always look great on paper or in a simple model, but then implementing it in reality is a whole different thing. And then uh, when I think about the, the issues facing the sea, uh, the, the, some of the proposals will address, okay, maybe there's too many nutrients in the water and we can do something about that or we can add oxygen, but then fundamentally, the sea's getting warmer and none of these proposals will help that. And, and still that will have a follow-on effect. And, and so kind of addressing pieces of it, I don't know, that just, it bothers me fundamentally. Um, so it's, it's having this more holistic approach and looking at the sea. But also I think from a societal perspective, we, we have to be practical from the standpoint that we are not going to get the sea of the early 1900s back. That's just, realistically, it's not going to happen from the standpoint that we have, what, 85, 90 million people in the catchment. We need agriculture to eat. People like living in the city, so we're going to have sewage issues. You know, cleaning's not perfect. So to some extent, there needs to be, I think, a societal discussion about is there a good enough? What can we live with? We're using the sea now. Yes, it could be better when we're, we're making steps, but I think that needs to be part of the discussion and the idea of, of, of reversing back to this Neverland state of, of being pristine or uh, less affected, I think is, is Eric, ambitious. Thank you. Eric, do you want to respond to that too, maybe uh, about your thoughts on types of geoengineering in there? whether there are any options out there that you think are potentially good. Of course, there are ideas about geoengineering. They are quite uh, strange, or not strange, but, but quite, um, uh, how should I say it? Um, they are quite creative thoughts about how to, thank you, creative thoughts about how to deal with the problem, like uh, injecting massive amounts of sulfur into the stratosphere, for instance, to ray to shield Earth from, from solar radiation, etc. And that comes with large amounts of different consequences which we are not aware of, really. I mean, changing the stratospheric chemistry involving the ozone layer and, and, and things like that, and also changing precipitation patterns, moving precipitation from some continents to others. And, and um, that comes with a lot of questions, of course. Who is going to really turn the knob on saying how much should we change things here or there? Should it be the minister, or should it be the European Commission, or should it be the president in 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 in, Your country. in the in the U.S. or someone else who who will decide what how to deal with those things? So I think it's uh, uh, it's of course worthwhile researching these things to see what kind of effects it might have, but I don't see it as a real thing. On the other hand, what can be done and probably needs to be done in terms of geoengineering, it's time it's it has to do with uh, trying to get the carbon out of the atmosphere. So uh, carbon capturing and, and storage is something that probably will be needed un unless we want to have 
very rapid continued increase of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's one thing that could be possibly dealt with. Okay, thank you. Back to the journalists. David? So I have a question uh, at Science. Our core readership is our primarily PhD scientists working at major research universities. And I guess this is a question from Michelle and Henrik a little bit. Um, it seems to me the incentive system in academia still rewards publication uh, and traditional academic activity. And I'm curious, in your experience, are, is there more that academia or others should be doing to encourage the kind of interactions you're engaged in with policymakers and industry? And have those interactions for you been an impediment or a reward for your own careers? Um, I can answer, well, should universities be doing more? Yes. Um, as far as Baltic Eye, I think that's one of the things that really attracted me about kind of the, the idea of Baltic Eye and, and, and one of the reasons I'm, I came to Stockholm is that part of our job is communication. I mean, that is something we are measured on. I mean, and, and so, and something that we're actually very enthusiastic about. So we, we do kind of willingly, that's part of our job. And, and I think that that's, you can look at Baltic Eye as maybe one model that other universities could adopt that if you're, you're really trying to cross this boundary between science and policymakers, maybe Baltic Eye teams are useful in other disciplines as well, in other universities where you have dedicated researchers who can do this bridging. Um, rather than expecting the traditional faculty member to, you know, in addition to teaching, managing a lab, writing grants, doing administrative stuff, and, oh, I got to communicate too, um, to have the kind of specialists like the Baltic IT. I think the place where I work, Stockholm Resilience Center, we have a similar mission uh, and vision as the, the Baltic IT does, really to engage in curiosity driven science, but on the other hand, also make sure that it is communicated and acted on in society, so it is really part of, of the job. And, and in our case, this study was really a curiosity-driven study, and then it turned out to be very relevant to society. But I think on the other hand, if I would not have continued to publish scientific papers, I, I mean, I've spent 24 seven the last five years on this project, I, my scientific career would probably have been finished. So I really need to do both at the same time. So. Uh, Janneke, and then Ken. Yes, and this one is for Eric again. You told us that you're now studying the more high resolution models. And could you say anything about what, what happens if, for example, the, the ice, there will be no ice in the northern Baltic Sea? So have you any predictions for that? The, in terms of the sea ice in the Baltic Sea, that depends very much, of course, on how large the warming is. So it's, it's very much emission dependent. And, and this is something we have seen already earlier in our regional climate models, that uh, in, in the very strong scenarios for the end of the century, there are many winters that are completely ice-free in most parts of the Baltic Sea. But this, we also have a large variability in, in our climate and weather here in, in this part of the world. So there will, of course, be cold winters also in the future. but uh, in those scenarios, very rarely with large sea ice extent over m large areas of the Baltic Sea. Uh, that is nothing I think that will change immensely in, in our really high resolution models. What I'm alluding to more there is the realism in, how, in our simulations of precipitation, capability of really capturing really strong cloud bursts and extreme precipitation and those kind of events. That's what we are working mostly with at the moment now. Um, yes, a follow-up with Henrik. Um, as to what these Keystone Dialogues might be doing for the scientists, um, I was quite struck by the statistic that the minister talked about in the drop of cod stocks. And I'm just wondering, can you see as these companies spend more time with scientists and get a long-range vision that they might actually reach a conclusion that they should voluntarily reduce their fishing pressure to make sure that there's, say, cod left for the minister's children? Or do you think that's never going to happen with these folks? Well, the, the ways that the companies want to engage is on the one hand to act as leaders by showing what responsible practices look like, and on the other hand to talk to a shared voice with politi politicians on what needs to be done. But when it comes to voluntary actions, we actually have been talking to them for the last three years about which voluntary actions should you be taking in regions where there are high risks of illegal fishing or human rights abuses. And they are actually discussing you know, 
how can they engage to build capacity there, or how can they, if, the, if it's not possible to improve the situation, actually move out and reduce uh, their efforts in regions where the problems are just too large to address. So I think with an increased understanding of what the problems are, I think the companies are, are increasingly interested in, in engaging in those kinds of activities. I had just one more question to Henrik following this one. You mentioned before about that uh, companies see that more and more people are ready to pay for these sustainable products, but isn't it that still globally that co community of that market is very small? So is it really like consumers can push the companies to do these right decisions, sustainable decisions? Or it's naive to think like that. I think what's happening here is it's a combination of many things. Consumers are pushing companies to be more sustainable. The, the climate change and the ocean degradation is pushing companies to take more responsibilities. And increasing efforts and activities by policymakers and the global policy agenda on the ocean is also pushing companies, the investment community, and, and risk. So it's all these things combined that are really leaves the companies with no option than to take responsibility. And I think the, the nice thing with working with these global companies is that they know that there's nowhere else to go. They, need, they know that they need to work with what they have, and that's yeah, not in good shape. Yeah. David. Oh, and David and then Peter. So, Anna, you made a call for embracing complexity uh, in the study of, uh, of chemical inputs to the sea. Uh, what does that look like in practical terms? I mean, is... is does a, does a PhD student in toxicology need to be doing something different or get some cross-training in ecology? What, how, what does that look like? So I can give you an example. And uh, this means that we would move away from much of the way that we have done things in the past, which was testing one chemical on one organism. This doesn't bring us forward, really. We know about that chemical in that organism, but it doesn't tell us about how the ecosystem would react to many chemicals. So what I do, for instance, is that I have a student, a PhD student, who works on complex mixtures of chemicals. And we work together with microbiologists to look at how these mixtures of chemicals affect the microbial community composition, and in the long term also their functions. So their ability to um, denitrify, de for instance, or to degrade carbon, such endpoints. This is one example. Okay, yes, and I would actually have a more or less follow-up uh, follow question to Anna, uh, because these um, problems that you are addressing, even if you uh, suggest that you should do it interdisciplinary, and that would, of course, be the most efficient way, but still, uh, it will take a long time for you to get uh, uh, results that you can communicate to, to uh, the decision makers. So what would you advocate for in, in the short term? Should there be, do you think there should be bans on certain, uh, uh, especially hazardous or risky uh, chemicals, uh, just, you know, yeah, or, or, or would you advocate for, for some other solution? Um, so we need to do many things at the same time, and things are happening. So we have chemicals that are banned, and uh, the REACH, uh, the EU chemical legislation, is functioning. It's one of the world's strongest chemical legislations, and their chemicals are banned due to their hazardous properties. And we see that this is efficient. So when a chemical is banned, concentrations in the environment are going down. So this is the way to move forward, but it's very slow. So one of the things that I, that I really do want to advocate is that we have to move away from the single chemical assessment. We have to be a bit braver, perhaps, or use the precautionary principle more, or use it at all, to actually assess groups of chemicals. This is one thing that I think we need to do, and when it comes to what is also very important is the monitoring work that we do, and Sweden is very strong in monitoring, and the Baltic Sea, there is a lot of data, and we have heard this before today. So we know a lot about chemicals in the Baltic Sea, 
But the chemicals we know most about is actually those chemicals that already are banned. We need to know more about those that we are using today. And this is something we can change now, and it's something that is coming also. Okay, last question to Yannicka. Oh, um, this is very, it's for any one of you, because um, I think that almost every one of you has told us that we don't know enough, and we needed more eyes on the Baltic, I think Michelle said. So, uh, you're free to answer anyone. Um, is there any, anything you would like to see being done more before the others? Is, is anything more acute than, than any other thing? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure each of you has a wish list. What's at the top? Sorry? Yeah, what's at the top? Yeah, Th thank you. Okay, who wants to answer that one? <laughs> Eric. Yeah, on my side, it's of course about uh, all of our climate models and how they are used and, and uh, how they need still to be developed and worked on. I, I was talking about very high resolution, etc. And we are, we are at the kind of edge of starting with these models. There are, there are basically no scenarios or calculations for, for the Baltic Sea region so far. There have been experimental runs here and there over the UK in the Alpine region, some small areas in the US, etc. We know that these models really show quite big differences in, in not just representing today's climate, but they also show stronger climate change signals, which is really bad in terms of uh, heavy cloud bursts. And uh, I would like to test these models here, of course, and apply them. That would be important for me. Uh, and then I think they could, as I said before, also be helpful if we can couple it better with the ocean to have a better description of the whole system that you're going to talk about here more in, in the forthcoming days of the conference for the Baltic Sea. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to come back to David's question on, on incentives. Of course, the project I'm engaged in could be a huge waste of time uh, if we achieve nothing. And, and many of the funders realize this, so it's hard getting funding for these kinds of things. So I would really, uh, during this conference, engage, like to engage in, in conversation on how can we explore sort of the unknowns and take bigger risks as scientists. We're supposed to explore, so, but how can we really explore further than the mainstream? That's a very nice note to end on. Okay, now in a typical press briefing, what happens is we say thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> and then the journalists run and grab somebody and take them off so nobody else can hear them and start peppering the questions about what is it they really want to know more about. Because they want to get there first. What we're going to do here is have an an opportunity to look into their heads about what do they really think and how do they think about it. So I'm going to ask each of the journalists very briefly, based on what they heard, tell us what is the story that they would pursue and what, would they, what did they find compelling about it and what would they need to know more about. And maybe start by just telling us who you think of as your audience. Let's start with you, Yannicka. Just turned it off. <laughs> yeah, kick it off. Um, I think and it's, briefly. I mean, this is a very hard decision, as you realize. Um, but maybe I'll go for Henrik, or, or the story about the, the industry, because I think it's quite funny, because it's, uh, it has several elements that I, kind of my readers are interested in. It's, it involves consumers, that you have some sort of power, actually. You can do something in your, <clears throat> in your everyday life. And I also like the method that <clears throat> science actually is reaching out to the industry and doing very practical research. I think that is very exciting. And it's going to be exciting to see what happens. And it's also a very acute problem, I think, that engage a lot of my readers. Um, they like fish. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, <coughs> Ken. Yes, hi. So I write mostly for non-scientists, although I have written for this guy and in Science Magazine. Um, and so I am reading, basically writing for the general public. Um, I see three things pop up to me today. I'll go through each quickly. One is, you know, Henrik's thing. I'm not sure I would be allowed in on these semi-secret uh, 
you know, meetings with the fishing, fishing folks, but that would be really interesting, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and part of the reason I'm interested in this is that I have been the king of the bummer story, you know, everything going to hell, and to see a solution in progress is kind of interesting. And it's also easier now to sell to editors, you know, who are tired of the bummer stories as well. Um, um, I also see Alf, excuse me, um, Eric as a, a great character for a story that I've been interested in a long time about how weather forecasters, at least in America, have either become um, complete uh, climate deniers or running screaming from it. And it'd be very interesting for somebody who has been a weather forecaster as well as a climate scientist and how it's a way into that story. But the one I would go peel off uh, right now would be Alf. Because if he could actually prove to me that there is some glimmer of hope that biodiversity, you know, rather than geoengineering, some bioremediation could help solve climate change. That's a really exciting story that with legs. And I think that would be really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, David. so at Science, we have about 200,000 PhD academics who read the, mostly the print magazine, and that's one very hardcore audience. And then we have a second audience, which is about five to six million visitors to our free online website, which is research findings. It can be anybody from an elementary school kid looking for a school project to uh, you know, a politician seeking uh, some context for some issue that they're interested in. So with those two audiences in mind, uh, further with the first audience, the PhD scientists, I too am interested in ALF's work on looking at, at the link between biodiversity and carbon storage and how that works and what the trade-offs are in terms of turnover and things like that. So I think there might be some interesting science in there. Um, in terms of the broader audience, um, yeah, Henrik's work is quite interesting because it, it's, it, it, it's occurring at an interface where most scientists are very, very uncomfortable. Okay, Peter. Yes, uh, I, I write for a, a, a very general public, uh, Swedish-speaking Finns, or any, anyone who knows Swedish and, and uh, uh, likes mm -hmm. to read about news in, in a Finnish context. Anyway, uh, I think that uh, climate change is always a, a topic that, that will, that will uh, interest our readers, and uh, therefore I, I would uh, go to, uh, to Eric and, uh, and uh, ask him to, to tell me more uh, about the new models that you're uh, developing, and. Uh, Understanding that you can't yet say what they're going to tell us because they're, they aren't in place yet, but you could uh, maybe you could tell me what uh, you hope to be able to to predict when when they are in place and what uh, how uh, how that will kind of change our knowledge and understanding of uh, climate change in, in a regional perspective in, in the Baltic context. Thank you. Sandra. Yeah, so uh, my audience as well as general public who are interested in processes and uh, getting to know things. So uh, for sure, I would need to search for concrete examples that are easy to show to people, and especially if I talk about TV. So it's especially like technically even I need to think what I will show for these people. So I have in my mind three actually stories that would be uh, first about the ALF if I'm thinking that it's because of visual things I could show and uh, using just seagrass or mussels as an example to, to really talk about the big issues and things happening in the Baltic Sea. About Anna, I was thinking because of the chemicals and things that are around in our environment that always is a bit scary for people. It's easy to attract attention and to tell that actually it's something we are using all the time and it's all around us. There would be a bit problematic for me to show it and explain because people will be a bit bored of going into the chemistry or something, but then uh, with some more research and really good examples and metaphors, I think that would be a very interesting story. And then again for Hendrik, we, oh, everyone I think mentioned Hendrik today, but this story for our audience would be good because it would show that finally again example that business and industry is nothing against the sustainability and um, and environment. Uh, you mentioned you had the small good examples on small scale, so I would be interested how to transform them in a big, bigger scale. Where is the lack, what we can learn from that? And what I like that actually it gave a bit of hope when I asked about this uh, consumers, can you really do something? Because people usually think like, okay, 
problems are going on. I'm too small to change something. That's it. The big companies will run their businesses. But when you said it's complex thing that uh, consumers, other issues, they give this push for companies, I think, I think for audience that would be good a message. Great, thank you. So, do you notice that the things that come up that they're looking for is they're looking for a character, right? A, a story about Eric as a way in. Or they're looking for examples, specific examples. Like, you know, maybe you go on a shopping tour with Anna and she guides you and tells you about some of these things. Then you've got the person and the example. Things that are surprising, the partnerships, the conversations that are going on uh, with business and sustainability, or the places you've never been with ALF, going to the bottom of the sea and seeing what is actually there, or the passion of a scientist like Michelle, who really wants to scale up the efforts that are happening here and has a good news story, but it needs to get much bigger and grow. So I think what we've heard here are about some connections, about how to advance solutions and new collaborations to rapidly scale up. This is a message that I think is coming through loud and clear. So I want to end with just giving each of the scientists like 15 seconds to give us a parting thought for the conference, and then we'll wrap it up. Let's start with Elf. Well, thank you. Well, think about everybody's talking about the Amazon and the rainforest and cutting down the rainforest and what that means to our climate. What we're really doing is cutting down a lot of biodiversity. The same goes on underneath the surface of the sea, and we need to understand what's going on. Thank you. I, I'm really inspired by the work that Henrik talked about in terms of keystone actors in um, fisheries. I think an, it would be equally interesting to do it for land-based agriculture because it's the number one activity that affects land use, climate change, you know, greenhouse gases, and eutrophication. So I see that as a huge opportunity to look at the big food companies. So, so get started. <laughs> hey, Anna. So, I mean, what I heard from, from, I think, all of us here was that we need to go out uh, of our comfort zones and work together with industry and work with interdisciplinary and work more towards managers and politicians um, and this is something that I would love to do more of uh, although I already do some of it and uh, I look forward to that. Thank you. Okay I meet a lot of people discussing climate change adaptation when I'm out speaking about climate change in Sweden uh, organizations and, and companies and, and politicians and others and the Climate change adaptation is on the agenda, really, and I think that's good since society really needs to adapt to the climate that is coming, or also the climate that we have already today. Uh, we don't know all of these details, but uh, that can be dealt with, I think, somehow. But what is important, I think, for you here in, in this uh, group now, people working very much with the natural ecosystems of the, of the Baltic Sea, I think the ecosystems are somehow not there in the debate all the time. It's very much focused on this adaptation, but the natural ecosystem needs a voice, and that voice is you, of course. Uh, so I think it's really good that you try to think more about how to com communicate the problems related with climate change in this context. So this is one of the most sensitive ecosystems we have here in our part of the world, in, in, in addition to the mountains, of course, in, in the north. So that's my message. Thank you. I think we as scientists often think that nobody really wants to care, nobody really wants to listen to what we're doing. But we heard the minister speaking about the importance of science for policies, and I know that this is true because I worked for this ministry before. Uh, the commissioner also spoke about the importance of science, and, and the businesses that we're working with are really interested in getting support from science. So I think we should use this opportunity when we're all here from different fields and different countries to share our experiences and how we are relating to other actors outside of academia because there are multiple ways in which our science can be used and there's a huge demand for it. Thank you all. I would like to uh, finally say that we look forward to the next few days of conversations continuing. Come up and talk to all of these folks and we invite you tonight to have a chance to present your own science in a minute and a half to the journalists and they'll tell you in real time what they found interesting, 
what they'd want to know more about, and why it might work for some of them and not others. So come to our thinking story like a journalist panel and pitch pit at six o'clock. And thank you to all of the panelists, scientists and journalists alike. Please join me. Okay, thank you very much for this really interesting uh, discussion. And I really hope, and this will, of course, initiate discussions, and this is really what we want, to take that with you and discuss outside. But before you leave now, we reconvene at 2 o'clock here, and then we have the plenary presentations. And I would like to see the session leaders one more time at 1 o'clock near the reception. Thank you very much.